Well, and the other is that you can go to school now without internet. We used to have protesters yeah. every Thursday. Pinkney would come with them. Yeah, we got it. We couldn't see them. Because if you think about it, it's you don't see the sign. I'll find out. Okay. Good morning, wow. ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to see you all here this morning. Um, here for uh, the meeting for Berrien County Committee of the Whole. Um, at this time, I would just like to remind you, uh, if you have any electronic devices, to please silence them or turn them off. Um, any materials that you may wish to have distributed to the board, please do so by giving it to our Sergeant of Arm, which is Commissioner Jim Kern. Um, and certainly if you're addressing the board, please come to the podium, state your name and your jurisdiction, um, and then proceed with your comments. Uh, with all of that housekeeping done, we're going to go ahead and do roll call. Bell. Current. Here. Harrison. Here. Hinkleman. Majeric. Here. Martin. Here. Scott. Present. Ballrath. Present. Werfel. Here. Yarborough. Present. Elliot. Freeling. Present. Madam Chair, you have nine present, three absent. Thank you very much. We have a quorum. Uh, now looking at the agenda, uh, approval of the minutes from October 6, 2022. Uh, I would entertain a motion to approve those minutes. Make that motion. I support. Is there any discussion, corrections? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Minutes are approved. All right. And before we go into some scheduled discussion, I just wanted to acknowledge some uh, guests that we have here in the audience. Uh, well, actually staff that we have here in the audience that definitely need to be highlighted. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to yeah. Brian. So uh, members of the board, at your 1030 regular meeting today, one of uh, the resolutions being brought forward is a resolution to authorize um, promoting Ashley Herr into the, uh, the director role at Animal Control. Ashley's in the back. Ashley, can you say hi to everybody? <laughs> Good, morning. Good morning. Good morning. So Ashley has been with us for a number of years. She is uh, <coughs> uh, the successful candidate uh, that's moved through the interview process. She's been in acting, or I'm sorry, in the interim role now for a number of months and um, just has done a really good job and um, her background is one where highly focused on uh, the, the quality of care and the care being provided to the animals that are in-house. So everybody, if you don't know Ashley, that's her. And then uh, two other folks that are in the audience today who have spent a lot of time working on uh, the mapping data that's going to be part of uh, the presentation. So we have Helen and Lex, and uh, they are part of our GIS department. And they have just been absolute rock stars on cranking uh, some of the data that uh, you're about to see. So thank you very much to both of them. Thanks for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Lex did ask that at, at some point he could just get the point to head out. So I'm going to leave that to you for whenever that time might be in the meeting. Well, I think he's a huge Detroit Lions fan, so we'll just wait until they win and then you can. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> well, and on that note, <laughs> I also want to take the moment just to thank those who are here from uh, the different municipalities who have taken interest in um, our broadband initiative and the work that we've been doing here. I know that we have representatives here from Pipestone, Lincoln Township. Um, really appreciate that you all are here. Um, with that being said, we're going to move into our scheduled discussion. We have Chris Shear here from DCS Technologies. Chris and his team have been um, working over the last several months mapping out um, Berrien County as it relates to broadband infrastructure, and he's here to give us that report. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Chris. I'm going to sneak to the back of the room just so that I can uh, view it with you all. But if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Freeling. Um, Thank you everyone for having me here today. It's been uh, a lot of fun over the summer. I spent uh, obviously 
most of my summer driving on the road in this county. Got to know it really well. Uh, for years, I've driven down I-94 between Chicago and Ann Arbor, which was a commute uh, for a big part of my career. But I never got off the expressway, so I really got to know <laughs> what all of those exits uh, looked like. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. 2,322 miles in this county. We saw every single one of them. Uh, 86,000 parcels. Uh, it's a very large county for being as rural as it is. There's a, uh, one of the largest, actually, actually, I think it's the largest county we have done so far. We've done about seven of them around the, the state. I... Uh, 39 municipalities, uh, again, I think that's the biggest number I've dealt with. 22 actual townships, we do everything by township. Uh, the survey township, just because it's got nice neat borders. Uh, so a lot of the municipalities, the, except for the cities, the, the villages, uh, we include those in the counts when we're talking about townships. So it's just a matter of clarification, but the way we did this study if we need to break out cities and villages individually, it's really easy to do. So, but for this report, we're gonna look at it by township. Uh, what I wanna talk about first is to go back to what really started this whole thing. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time, uh, but a couple of years ago, while we were in the middle of studying one county, uh, the pandemic hit. And all of a sudden this work that we do became very, very important. We were working on Washtenaw County, the University of Michigan, faculty was being sent home, students were being sent home. And a lot of the uh, townships around the city of Ann Arbor did not have service. So we were already aware of that, we were already working on it, but it became uh, obvious that we have a big problem in the entire country. And so that's, uh, what got us here. This map here represents what the FCC, I'm going to say, used to report uh, because the Form 477, this is a form, and I know some of you have already seen this. Uh, there's been a, a couple of uh, initiatives before uh, we came on that has talked about this. Uh, from a mapping standpoint, this is how we view the world. We look at it down to the parcel level. And this is what the FCC reported as being serviced, having internet, having access to internet. Uh, all the orange you see there was not qualified to receive any kind of funding, federal funding, to build broadband internet because the FCC assumed that it was already done. The reason it looks like this is because they used a reporting system by census block. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard about that. Uh, but if one home in a census block has service by, say, Comcast, uh, that entire census block was considered served, even if there was two or 300 homes in that census block. So that's what created this map, and that's what kind of uh, prevented anybody from doing anything beyond those areas that are not colored in. When I... And, and, and well, I wanted to be fair about this because that other map, I, that was based on a standard of a minimum of 25 megabit per second download speeds, three megabit per second upload speeds. And in 2020, that's what the FCC thought was adequate for home internet services. Most of you will know based on your own experience at home, that doesn't work. So to be fair, I took out the areas that uh, I, were uh, were just 25.3 and raised, and this is, again, this is FCC data. I raised the threshold to 100 uh, by 10, which is the actual, the current uh, minimum is 100 by 20, but the FCC has finally raised their minimum to 100 by 10, and that's what the map looks like now. Uh, all of the yellow areas would qualify for federal funding, but all the orange areas do not. And even though that probably looks closer to what is actually out there, there is still a ton of uh, homes in those orange areas that do not have service. When we went out and did our mapping, this is actually what it looks like. This is what the served area looks like at a parcel level, looking at the entire county, of who has access to 100 by 20 megabit service. 
It's a lot of white area in there. Uh, some of it's farmland, some of it's unoccupied, some of it's wooded area. Uh, we went through and we broke all that down. And Chris, can I say too, on that prior map, all of those different colors are identified as your service providers, correct? Yes, yeah. <clears throat> and the one that's prevalent up there is the color red. That is Comcast is your largest service provider in the county that has services that can provide 100 by 20. Uh, the other two major providers you have available right now is MEC, Midwest Energy and Communications, and AT&T. AT&T is in the process of building fiber now, replacing a lot of their old copper plant in some areas. Those areas are really too small to see on the countywide map, but we can see them very well when we get to the township's uh, scale maps. Uh, but they're represented also in that map. You can kind of see a little bit of blue uh, up near Benton Harbor. Uh, that's AT&T only area that does provide fiber. And you can see a little bit of yellow, uh, a, a different color yellow along the eastern border up uh, along Bainbridge Township. That's where MEC has existing fiber services available. But the rest of it has nothing at the moment. So if we add the, uh, the areas back in that the FCC claimed was served, that orange now represents uh, the unserved according to the, or based on the FCC data, or I should say contrary to the FCC data is what I'm meaning to say. Uh, these orange parcels now uh, are showing you all of the reported areas that would not have qualified for federal funding. We went out and we checked all of the unserved areas and this is actually a better picture of what it all looks like now. The served area is still red and yellow and blue, but all of the orange are the actual occupied parcels that do not have access to high-speed internet. The yellow areas you see in there, the kind of the blank areas, those are the unoccupied parcels that I talked about. We don't count those, uh, although when we're out there building fiber and new systems, we're gonna be going by a lot of those areas. So if they do get developed in the future, uh, there'll be access to it. So the next step is what do we do uh, as far as federal funding? And we've got one program that's been active in Berrien County called the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, uh, or RDOF for short. And the dark yellow area you see in there that kind of filled in kind of the mustard color yellow, uh, solid color, that is where MEC has federal funds granted to them to build fiber. So we're underway. We're starting to fill in a lot of those gaps. Uh, they're just getting started. Uh, they have some activity, I believe, in Bainbridge Township, uh, south in Pipestone Township, uh, near around uh, Eau Claire. Um, but again, they're just getting started. That's funded by the FCC, by the federal uh, government, and won't. And we don't really have to worry about that. But we can leverage some of that, I think, to help with some of the other areas. Uh, the kind of purple area is another company called Mercury Broadband. Uh, a lot of people know them as Mercury Wireless. Uh, they've been a wireless provider for a number of years, uh, but they've committed through the FCC program to provide fiber now in some of their new areas. And that's what the purple represents. So we've got uh, another provider coming into the county uh, that's going to help out. On this map here, you'll see a lot of smaller purple areas toward the bottom. Uh, a lot of those were based on the wireless technology that Mercury uh, Broadband offers. And today, that in just two years' time, that doesn't actually qualify for funding anymore, even though they're now obligated to build it. That'll be a, uh, an alternate method for getting some high-speed internet services in those areas. But a lot of those areas will be looked at again for fiber networks. So this, I just did this to kind of give you a better sense of where the RDOF areas are uh, by uh, fading out everything else. So you can see, I just kind of brought them to the surface. So we've got the maps done. The data has been turned over to the county. Uh, Lex and Helen was introduced to you at the beginning. They're working uh, right now, I'm getting all those, all that data into an interactive system 
that all the townships will have access to. Uh, we wanted to demonstrate that this morning. Uh, we're not going to be able to, but. Can I ask a question? Chris? Yes, sir. Uh, would you please use a microphone so that anyone can hear? Do we have a handheld? You can just pick it up. Go ahead, Dick. Okay. Uh, yeah, my question is, is the only only means of uh, internet here to meet the federal standards by fiber? <laughs> yes and no. The, the, the goal is to provide fiber everywhere because fiber has the, the longest life cycle available to us today. Uh, but the coax networks that the cable companies have been provided also have the capacity to provide the speeds that we need. Uh, and it's going to continue to grow with us for probably the next 15, 20 years. Uh, they have new standards coming out. Uh, Comcast has new technologies coming out that will be able to reach gigabit speeds, uh, multi-gigabit speeds on their coax-based network. So every place that they are, we, we consider served. However, to continue to build that type of technology is much more expensive than fiber is today believe it or not. Uh, the coax networks requires electronics, it requires uh, devices at every pole. Uh, the fiber optic uh, designs that we're using are all passive, doesn't require a lot of electronics. They have something at the, the beginning of the system and a little device at the home. Otherwise, it's just a, a clear piece of fiber that entire distance. So it's a lot more reliable. It's got a lot more life left in it. All of the fiber that we invest in and build today, uh, I predict has at least a 70 year lifespan available to it. Not only physically, because we've, we've demonstrated that building copper cable plant uh, throughout all of these areas, it'll last 60, 70 years. I mean, a lot of the, the telephone systems that people still have uh, landlines on was built in the 50s and 60s. Uh, Physically, we know how to build a cable that can stay in the ground for 50 or 60 years. Fiber also has the capacity. Uh, we're talking about gigabit speed today. You know, to be able to get a gigabit download speed in someone's home through a fiber optic cable, that's great. But that fiber optic cable, that piece of glass that comes into your home is actually capable of several thousand times that speed. They're testing terabit speeds in the lab right now. So there is no limit. Uh, in the future of that fiber that we're going to ever get to for home use. Chris, if I, if I may, really the, the driving sort of decision making as it relates to technology is the speeds that mm -hmm. are being defined and the technology that's being utilized, uh, whether it be coax, fiber, wireless, uh, satellite, <laughs> they're all contingent on meeting that speed. And as the speeds increase, like what you were saying, mm -hmm. fiber is one of the most future-proof because we know that it can, it can hold much more bandwidth, uh, for yes. lack of a better term, and speed to be able to get those pulses to the home versus satellite, cellular, those types of things. They're not able to achieve the speeds, particularly if it's metric. Correct. Yeah, the, and the fiber, she's absolutely correct. It has the capacity today to to last for 70 years. Uh, there's nothing else that does. The coax networks, I think they're going to top out at about 10 gigabits per second. Uh, that's still, it's hard to imagine a home needing a 10 gigabit per second circuit. Uh, but they're eventually, they're going to start to rebuild all of that uh, as that coax uh, network starts to deteriorate more. They're going to start to replace that only with fiber as well. The wireless technologies, everyone in this room knows how many times have they bought a new cell phone over the last 25 years because there's a new generation out, a new speed. The life cycle for wireless, any wireless technology today is three to five years. There's already things going on in the lab for the next generation. 6G is in the lab now. I, I suspect we're going to start hearing about 6G wireless services by the end of next year. Uh, because they can. 5G has failed to deliver in a lot of areas. Uh, they haven't even you know, got it debugged everywhere that they've said it would work before. And now we're gonna start talking about 6G. By the time this fiber uh, starts to get to its end of useful life, 
we're going to be up around 20, 25 G on the wireless stuff, on the cellular stuff. So it will continue to evolve, but that's a, what they call a forklift upgrade. Every time we change, everybody's got to buy new devices, new equipment, the towers, cell towers have to uh, get upgraded. Uh, so the wireless technology, I, I look at it as a five-year life cycle uh, before we have to refresh it. The fiber technology, 70 years, we could still be just running gigabit to the home and still be more than happy with the performance. So. And Chris, the only thing I wanted to say on wireless, and I'll stop interrupting, when you see 3G, 4G, 5G, it's talking about generation, right? Like yes. It's, it's, so when you say 25G, it just means the 25th generation of whatever the technology is. Right, right. Okay. And it's, it's the same life cycle for Wi-Fi. You know, Wi-Fi and cellular are two different types of technology. They're both wireless. A lot of people, you know, don't really differentiate the two because, you know, they're, they're somewhat ubiquitous most everywhere we go anymore. And you know, we walk in, we put our Wi-Fi password in. We don't know if we're talking on Wi-Fi or cellular. Uh, but that, too, every five years is going through a life cycle change. You know, we're, uh, we're on AX right now. Uh, B, I think it's BC is the next generation that's already being talked about. And there's a lot of places that are still operating on two generations old that nobody even realizes because it's still adequate. Uh, so that also goes through the same kind of life cycle. So let's talk about the township maps. Uh, we've collected a lot of data. And if you look at uh, the raw data, there's a lot of different symbols on there. A lot of, we, we show where the community anchor institutes are. We show where uh, commercial locations are, we show, uh, we even show where the cemeteries are. Uh, and, and the main reason for that is because a lot of cemeteries might have an address associated with it. And for us to make sure that we get the database correct, we have to count it. We had to classify it as something. So we classify it as a cemetery, probably doesn't require broadband service, but that parcel has been counted because we're trying to get to that 86,000 count to make sure we've counted every single parcel in the county. These are the important ones. And these are the ones that you will see on the online maps. It shows who the service providers are today, Comcast, MEC, AT&T. Uh, and then it shows uh, the two most important unserviced areas by differentiating the unoccupied from the unserviced. The unserviced are the ones that we need to get to. Those are the ones that there's, uh, Occupied residents there, there's a, maybe a small business there. They don't have access. So those are all designated uh, with the gray color. If it's unoccupied, if it's a, a maybe a farm parcel that uh, is just being farmed or uh, a, a forest patch somewhere, um, then that's designated as unoccupied. The other thing that uh, we wanted to show was where we're at as far as the federal funding goes. The RDOF providers, we have two right now, Mercury and Midwest Energy or MEC. And so they're designated by those colors. And then we've got a, a, a hatch that we over top of it to identify. Remember I said earlier, Mercury's got some wireless areas down in the south part of the county. Uh, that's gonna have that horizontal hatch that says just above baseline. That, that's to tell you that that area is gonna get something but it's probably not good for the long term. So we're still gonna look at it to bring in fiber to it. Uh, the gigabit uh, hatch, the vertical hatch uh, going up and down that's overlaid on both of those shows you where all of the fiber plans are right now that are currently under construction. So with that, we'll look at a couple of examples. And these are what you, these are what you're going to be able to see online. This is, uh, we saw a township. You can see most of that is gray. Uh, the hatched area are the unoccupied parcels. All of the solid gray areas are parcels that have homes, small businesses, uh, farming operations that do not have service. Uh, you can see a little bit of red up there just under the, the balloon. That's where Comcast has some service. And then you see the green down to the right. If we zoomed in on that, you'd see that that was one of the Mercury wireless RDOF areas that we're gonna look at building fiber through anyway. Uh, but that particular area around that lake, I uh, will get a, a different type of wireless technology probably within the next year or two 
uh, that will offer some level of internet services that will be adequate for a lot of people, especially if they're closer to the towers. Chris, can I ask on the maps when we see them, there's white parcels. Can you, you can go to the next one too, that's fine. Um, there's white parcels in there and there's a question of what the, the white represents. Is that parks? Uh, yeah, please. The, the community parcels that are otherwise served by high speed broadband. So these are commercial businesses, healthcare services, schools, parks, and cemeteries might be in that category. Um, that might be in a, yeah, these white areas are other parcels that are otherwise served by high speed internet. For example, schools receive internet through the Regional Educational Services Act, RESA, and healthcare would, and commercial businesses often get. Uh, non-residential internet programs, uh, which are not included in this consideration of unserved. Thank you. Unserved Alan. here includes, yeah, farm parcels, um, unoccupied vacant land, undeveloped land. This is broken down further. Yeah. Hel Helen and Alex have been uh, translating the data into kind of a, a simpler format so that it is easier to understand uh, once you start to look at it online. And so there will be some uh, things in there and the reason that they're there, and I'll use the anchor institutes, the, the town halls, the police departments, fire departments, those are all identified throughout. Uh, if they don't have access to service, they're identified as an unserviced parcel. If they do have access to service, they're identified as a, commu uh, a community anchor institute because there are going to be programs coming out in relation to some of the federal funding programs that want to know where those are and possibly have other programs that might tie to it. What we're concerned about today is where all the unserved parcels are so that we can get that first part done uh, before we start breaking it down into smaller projects. The schools, another example, uh, schools, the county uh, has already interconnected all the school districts. The schools typically have uh, some type of high-speed internet coming to them. Uh, a lot of it's done in a consortium uh, arrangement. So we've identified where they're at, but we didn't make them part of uh, the unserved areas unless we could identify that they were actually unserved, which we didn't find a single school that didn't have some kind of connectivity to it. So the schools are identified separately and then some of the other ones, uh, which that'll all be available on the online version. Uh, these were the maps that we prepared, or I should say that the GIS group prepared to send out to each of the townships to kind of give them a broad view of what, what they could expect. Uh, this next example, uh, this is the best example of showing the three service providers, even though AT&T doesn't show up on this one, you can see uh, here in Water Valley that uh, a good portion of that township is serviced by uh, Comcast. The northern edge that solid yellow color, that means that it's already serviced by MEC. They've got fiber coming down from Van Buren County uh, to service some of those areas. But they also have, you see that there's a uh, yellow with a vertical hatch going through it. Those are RDOF areas where MEC is already planted on building fiber. But if you look at the top of that map there, you can see that there's a uh, solid gray parcel <laughs> between the hatched yellow and the solid yellow, which tells me as an engineer, we need to be talking to MEC about making sure that those all get filled in as well, uh, one way or another, uh, while they're planning on building in that area. Did you run across any charter? There's no charter in Berrien County. Really? Really. <laughs> I was surprised too. I, but yeah, I I work with charter in other areas. Uh, in fact, I was uh, on the phone this morning with a. Uh, their government representative that takes care of this whole area, including all the RDOF programs. And she and I have had a lot of conversation about burying and the fact that they're just not here. Doesn't mean that they might not be interested in some of the work that we ask them to bid on though. Uh, because Charter today, Charter has completely abandoned the coax architecture for their networks and everything they do today is fiber. So just, there's certainly a candidate uh, for us to talk to when we start looking at how we fill in some of these gaps. Yeah, Charter Communications. 
Yeah, Charter Communications is the second or third largest cable company in the country. Comcast is the largest. Uh, and typically, there's not a lot of counties in the state of Michigan that don't at least have one or the other. Uh, but mo a lot of them have both. So it is kind of unusual to be a major population area like Berrien County and not have a charter in the area. Uh, this one, I just, I wanted to put another example up. This is Buchanan Township. Uh, it, it's kind of hard to see in the city of Buchanan, but you'll see uh, kind of up and to the left, there's some blue areas there because this is an area where AT&T has started rebuilding all their old copper and replacing it with fiber. I would guesstimate that two thirds of the city of Buchanan is now got fiber gigabit fiber available to uh, the residents there. Uh, they replaced their copper system and they're still underway doing it. I, I found that in the city of Niles. I found it here in St. Joseph. I found it in Benton Harbor. Uh, and they've been just quietly starting to replace a lot of their <laughs> copper with fiber. So we got an alternative there. All of it so far has been most, well, I should say most of it so far has been in existing service areas, their existing service areas. Uh, and it has been in areas that already has Comcast. So most of these people now have a choice of two high-speed providers, uh, which we identified, but good for them. We need to move into the, the rural areas and find out how to get it to everybody else. So that's about all I'm gonna say on where Comcast and AT&T are today. <laughs> We may be talking to both of them about how we expand it, but uh, this is just to, to let everybody know where they're at right now. Uh, this was the uh, Bainbridge Township and was the best example of showing the RDOF uh, service areas. You can see on the right-hand side of the, the map is a, a solid yellow. That's where Midwest Energy MEC has existing fiber. That large yellow area with the uh, vertical patching is where they're planning on building fiber. Uh, that green area down uh, in the lower right, that is where Mercury has fiber planned. So we've got a good portion of Bainbridge already underway, but you can see with the gray areas, uh, there's still a lot left that we need to address. And Chris, I would say the board took action on that and Bainbridge is going to be having their entire township together <laughs> through the matching. Good. Good. Yeah, I knew that that was uh, underway. There's a. I'm going to get to the last slide, and we're going to talk a little bit about the the, the costs. But they're going to be. Uh, it's going to be considering that there are uh, areas like Bainbridge and Orinoco uh, that are already underway doing things. Uh, we've got a good start. We got a long way to go. I've already mentioned, you know, some of the other parcels. This is the full legend of what uh, uh, the data is that we collected. Uh, we got the community parcels, the community anchor institutes, the schools, the parks and public places, uh, and then the commercial, industrial, and healthcare areas. Those are the large uh, commercial areas where we know they've got service. They've had service for years. They're not part of the residential uh, and, you know, the rural area problem. Uh, they're all set but we had to identify them again so we could count them, make sure that we had everything counted in the county, make sure we got to that 86,000 number uh, when we were finished. It, it's kind of like a checklist. When we get to 86,000, we know we've checked every single parcel. <laughs> and this one, I did not bring binoculars for everybody, unfortunately, uh, but you've all got this in your packet. Uh, this is, uh, the cost estimate based on industry trends in Michigan today of what it's going to take to build fiber to all of those unserved homes. Uh, we have a total of 11,539 parcels as of the summertime, because it this is a very dynamic uh, effort. Things are changing. AT&T is starting to, you know, continuing to build. MEC is building right now. Uh, so that number is starting to go down. Uh, the RDOF plans, we've got 2,800 or 2,681 parcels that I've shown you that are already in somebody's plan to serve, uh, which leaves us a 
just shy of 9,000 more that we need to make plans for. That 9,000 based on today's, uh, like I say, today's industry trends in Michigan uh, is going to cost somewhere between 48 and $84 million to fill it all in with fiber. Each of the townships have been broken down. And again, uh, like uh, Commissioner Freeling said, Bainbridge has been approved. So that number can probably come off of that bottom line. Orinoco, we know, has been uh, awarded to MEC. That number can come out. So those numbers are starting to go down. But how we go forward, uh, this is going to be kind of the baseline that we can work from so that we look at each individual township or however we want to do it. We might want to group townships together. Uh, in some areas, they're trying to do the entire county all at once. Uh, Berrien has put a lot of effort into getting us to this point. Uh, there's been a lot of activity already. So our path forward has started to be defined. Uh, we just need to figure out where we go from here. It's not, how can we have such a spread there are 48 million to 84 million? The cost today to build a fiber cable on a telephone pole uh, aerially, uh, hang it in the air, is typically uh, 30 to $50,000 a mile, depending on the condition of the poles and you know how we're actually running it. If we have to bury that cable down the road right of way underground, that cost goes up to oh, 70,000 per mile or more. Difference in what we do. Exactly. And different areas are gonna have different costs. When we get out into the rural areas where we have clean poles, nothing else attached to it, and they're three or 400 feet apart, the cost is gonna be way down. In the city like this, where we have to run through people's back lots, uh, that cost goes up to run it aerially. So this is a range based on actual estimates that have come in for other areas around the state that are looking at it uh, based on numbers that have been provided by the actual providers who would be building it. So uh, I yeah, you have this kind of information by or the cost by township. Yeah, that's why I say okay. I, I didn't bring my binoculars. Actually, I did bring my binoculars. <laughs> Dick, what we'll do, we'll, Dick, we'll circle back with you and make sure that we get you all the information that you need for Lincoln Township. I'd like to open it up for questions to the commissioners being mindful of time. Chris, did yeah. you have one more item? That you well, I was to just going to say, if we could, somebody that's got it on their screen, look at Lincoln Township uh, and just give them those two numbers real quick. Um. I will, I will pull that up, but while I'm doing that, let me um, turn to, oh, Dave's got it? Okay. Yeah, 1 million 20,000 for minimum, and 2 million 40,000 maximum. So, so 1 to 2 million to finish up Lincoln Township. Yeah. And then Commissioner Yarbo had a question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mike. Um, Mike. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Here we Thank you. What I would like to ask, uh, there's a sentence that says total funding required to fill all gaps. You've not mentioned the cities and you told us you're just talking about townships. What about <laughs> what about the cities? They're not in that number. This yeah. city, the cities are listed separately in this table. They are in that. Yes. I saw it on my computer. I still couldn't. Still yeah, couldn't see you, it. you, but you're uh, Benton Harbor, Benton city Harbor, of Benton yes. Harbor, the city of Benton Harbor. I uh, has a few unserved left. Um, I think it's more than you all know. When we were in some meeting with uh, we found Alex Little, 18, we found 12 unserved areas. Areas. Or par actually, I'm sorry, this is by parcel. We found 12 unserved parcels. In the whole city of Benton Harbor, there are 12 places that have no, no access. No wire, no access. Right. Okay. <laughs> and then I want to know who do you work for? When I saw two ME somethings, I wondered who do you work for? Who I work for? Yes. Me. He, 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 okay. He's from DCS <laughs> Technologies. Okay. And I saw that on the back, you know, behind your name. That's what I didn't know when I saw. Oh, yeah. the, the Midwest. letters. Yeah. Two mm -hmm. things. So you're, you're private. Yes, I'm an independent consultant. I've been in the business for almost 44 years now. 
I did start out working for Comcast way back in the 70s, mm. climbing telephone poles. So I've been doing this kind of outdoor broadband work uh, forever. Uh, in fact, when I started working in the cable industry, we had 12 channels and they didn't know how to spell HBO yet. Yes. So yes. I've, I've seen a lot happen. Uh, Thank, but, you. Uh, Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Commissioner Kern. Uh, good morning, Chris. Good morning. You spent a lot of time talking about speeds early on in your presentation. Yes. Now, I have, I'm in the uh, Niles Township, so I have Comcast, I have the coax, and I pay a, a, a plan for speeds, but my plan says up to a certain speed. And I do speed tests every once in a while and find out that, you know, there's time of days when I'm on a computer and I'm paying for, say, 110, but I'm only getting eight and two. Now, does fiber also have that same loss? Because what I'm being told is that when I'm doing that speed test and getting those low speeds is because there are a lot of people on the system. So that pulls my speed down. Does the same thing occur with fiber? Do you get that loss with fiber like you do with the coaxial cable? Yes, to okay. a degree. Then, Comcast then, is more susceptible, or the coax is more susceptible to that because I, you're all on the same line. It's the Comcast architecture, the coax architecture is what they call a bus, and everybody's connected to that same bus. Uh, it's kind of like the electrical outlets in your house. No matter where you plug it in, you've got electricity. If everybody's got something plugged in, then you can start to pull down the, the amount of electricity that's available. In fiber, that fiber typically goes all the way back to that central office or that data center where it originates. So on your path to the house, that's not affected the same way. But what happens in the data center, if the entire city is you know, at five o'clock, everybody's getting home, they're checking their email, everybody's getting on it. The data center itself is where the congestion starts to happen and you start to see it come down. But because it's set up, uh, more as a point to point rather than a bus, uh, it's not as bad as it uh, would be. Yeah. Okay, so then the, the standards that they set don't necessarily have to be met on a regular basis then, correct? Because, uh, you know, even in unserved areas, if they're getting new service and they're saying, we'll give you up to 110, but they're not getting 110, I don't know how to ask that question then. <laughs> they're, they're telling you, yeah, if nobody else is on the system, I'm going to give you 110 and you're going to pay for 110, but you, you're probably not going to get 110. How, how, how does that work when you're satisfying, you know, the FCC standards to say, okay, here's the standards we've set. And they say, well, on a good day, we can match that. But 99% of the time, you're not going to get it. Here's how, here's how, how does that qualify work? that. I, Comcast right now has the capability to offer a gigabit download to your home. And the difference between that and a hundred meg service is just how your modem is configured and how their head end is configured. To the FCC, their point is, well, you've got a gigabit available. So mm -hmm. the performance of their system should, if you've got a hundred meg service, that's what you're paying for. I would expect it to be a consistent 8590 at any given time. If it's much below that, then there's probably a problem with the system that needs to be looked at, a maintenance issue or something going on. Uh, but if I've got 90 meg that I can measure on 100 meg uh, service with coax, that's I expect that. In gigabit speeds on a fiber, I don't expect anything more than 930 meg to 950 meg uh, on any given day. And I'm, I, I know that's their gigabit speed because there are some things going on with the data, the, the overhead stuff, you know, the, the, how they uh, avoid errors and a lot of technical things that I don't want to <laughs> try to drill into uh, that automatically bring that down. So, yeah, that's why they say up to uh, as long as it's within a couple percentage points of what that maximum speed is, mm -hmm. it's OK. If it's getting down, if I've got a gigabit circuit and I'm measuring 600 megabit down, I'm going to be calling uh, the fiber provider and asking what's up. Mm -hmm. Step in there. So we're we're pushing the clock right yep. now. Okay. Um, I know that there was one other commissioner that had a question, but we still have uh, to open it up for public comment as well. So. Uh, mine is really short. Sure. I just wanted everybody in the room to know and watching 
the total funding of 48.566 to 84.570. Um, right now, through the state and the federal government, um, there is lots of opportunities for broadband grants, and that's why the county has a grant writer through Southwest Michigan Planning Commission to assist in the municipalities in filing for that those particular grant funding in order to really cut into those figures. Mm -hmm. So that's not something that the county is actually paying for as a county or the municipalities. I just wanted to make that clear. That's it. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. Quick follow up on uh, Commissioner Scott's point. At today's Finance Committee, um, Finance will be asked to endorse an amendment to Southwest Michigan Planning Commission's contract for the grant writing services. We're asking to add time and cash onto that agreement. Assuming Finance says yes, we'll bring that forward to the board as early as next week. Mm -hmm. The intent is now that the state of Michigan is pushing money out to the local units of government to go after broadband funding, we're trying to have the team in place that can help us take as many shots and um, cast a wide net. Mm -hmm. So finance will be asked to consider a bid waiver today uh, for the sole source uh, approval of continuing uh, through the end of 2024 uh, for Southwest Michigan planning with the intent of funding that work through the ARPA allocation that the boards approved the $6 million allocation for broadband services. The other point I wanted to make is everything that Chris has just provided um, between uh, Helen and Lex, we are working to update our GIS maps. We are working to push that out to each and every township. We've already sent the better part of a dozen emails pushing maps out, as well as the unserviced data to the, the various township supervisors. For anyone who's watching this online, if you need it, call, email, text, we'll get it to you. Um, for the board, Chris is planning to stay through uh, your committee meetings, through your regular meeting. If you want to chat with him, he's going to be here. Now, with that said, we are officially running over. We <laughs> absolutely are. And so I want to just take the time, thank Chris for the work that he and his team have done. Thank you all for your uh, questions and your leadership on this initiative um, we'll be discussing more what are those next steps for the county now that we have this data in hand. Um, with that having been said, I'm going to open it up for public comments. Again, reminding the public, if you do have a comment, to please come to the podium, state your name and where you are from. Um, and I see that there's a, a run on that podium. If there's anyone that would like to make a comment, please do so. Yeah, we're uh, at Lincoln Township. Uh, my name is Dick Stoffler, Township Supervisor. And uh, we're preparing our application now that we have the maps and, and all the parcel information that uh, your company has so uh, graciously provided. But uh, we have to put in our application how much we expect to have to apply for. So when you, with these kind of numbers, like 1.1 1 .1 or 1 million to 2 million, what number do we put in our application? I mean, that is a huge, huge difference. Is there anybody to help me with that? Yeah. Put the, put the high number. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go conservative. <laughs> uh, go with, with the, uh, the higher number and work with Southwest Michigan Planning to, we will supply them with, with Chris's data. They will then do a confirmation through their geo software and between what Chris has supplied and then what Geo supplies, you should have a pretty right. solid range. Yep. Um, those applications are due by the end of this month, right. October 31st. <laughs> and there is no required local match, but we would certainly encourage you to sharpen your pencil and put in what the township can truly afford. Yep. We understand. Yeah. Um, okay. We do have a, by the way, we do have a 10 o'clock uh, conference call with Comcast and uh, Southwest Michigan Planning Commission and your consultant to help us wade through this. Great. Thank you, Dick. For, <laughs> thank you for, for your leadership on this from your township. Are there any other comments? Hearing